In this video, we're going to go over nine GD science sample questions from their website. Which conclusion can be drawn from the information in this map? The first one, volcanoes are scattered randomly across the Earth. Well, the yellow dots are the volcanoes, the black lines, those are the plate boundaries. But there's definitely a pattern going on here. It's not random, so A is no good. The next one, volcanoes are only located along edges of continents. But beware of words that are really strong, like only, because they often mean that it's not correct. Volcanoes are only located along the edges of continents. Well, that's true for the most part over here, but then we've got a bunch in the ocean over here. So it's not always true, so that one's out. Okay, the third one, volcanoes are mostly located along boundaries between plates, but that word is much better because it's much more inclusive. And that is true, volcanoes are mostly located along the boundaries between plates, so along those black lines. But occasionally you get some out in the middle of the ocean, but that's okay, because they're still mostly there. So C is true. Okay, let's check out another. Which statement correctly describes the flow of energy through this pyramid? So the assumption is the energy starts with producers, which are plants and it's gonna get passed on to animals, which are consumers. The first one, all the energy from the lower levels is available to the top. But once again, beware of that strong word all right there. And let's see if that's true. Well, the energy goes from the bottom to the top and it's shrinking. So it's definitely not all available to the things up top here. So that one's not true. Okay, the next one, the producer level directly provides energy for all the other levels. But once again, we've got that word all. And the producers are here. They only provide energy to the primary consumers. But that's it. They don't directly provide to any of the other ones. So B, that's not true. Okay, C, the highest amount of energy is transferred between levels that contain consumers. But that's not true because the highest energy goes from here to here. So it goes from producers to consumers, not from consumers to consumers. So C, that's out. But finally, we know it's gonna be D. Energy is directly transferred from primary to secondary consumers, and that would be from here to here. So that is true, and that's our correct answer here. Okay, let's look at a graph. Which conclusion is supported by the data in this graph? A, solubility always increases as temperature increases. But once again, we've got that strong word always. Now temperature increases when you go to the right. Solubility increases when the graph goes up. But for the purple one, that one actually goes down and decreases. So that's not always true. And A, that's out. For B, at 40 degrees Celsius KCL, that's the green one here. That has the highest solubility of all the salts in the table. Well, let's just find that. 40 degrees, we go straight up. KCL is here. But that doesn't have the highest solubility because the blue and the red, those are both bigger than it. So B, that's not true. Okay, C, the rate of change, let's highlight that. That just means slope, by the way. In the solubility of KNO3, that's going to be the blue graph. That changes as temperature increases. Okay, that's a mouthful. Basically, does the slope of KNO3 change? That's the main question. But slope is steepness, and if you're driving up this hill, it's just getting steeper and steeper, so the slope, it definitely changes. So C, that's our correct answer here. So just take your time with these ones and you'll find it. Okay, the next. Sometimes you don't even have to read the passage to get it. Which fact from the passage supports the argument that parasitic fungi offer at best severely limited potential as insecticides that target many kinds of insects? So there's a lot going on there, but basically, which of these statements here might be a limiting factor in killing many kinds of insects. Okay, the first one, the fungi reproduce inside an insect's body. Well, that would be helpful as an insecticide because then it would make sure to attack the insect. 
So this one is actually good so far. Okay, B. The fungi entirely control the insect's behavior. Well, in terms of an insecticide, that seems really, really helpful. So again, there's nothing limiting its potential. So B, that one's out. Okay, C. Some of the fungi may be host-specific parasites. Well, let's take a look here. Because if it's host-specific, it may only go after one type of thing, like ants, but not after many things like cockroaches or termites. So therefore, if it's host-specific, that does have limited potential, and this one is the correct answer here. So often, if you just try to do it based on logic, then you can find the right answer without having read the full passage there. Okay, another one. Which statement describes the pattern here? Well, just take your time, go one by one. The first one, doubling the net force, increases acceleration four times, when the mass is constant. With these ones, try to find whatever is constant first, the mass. So let's find both of those here. But then we want to see, do we double the net force? What we actually do, we go from 8 to 16 here, so that checks out. But do we increase the acceleration four times? Well, we go from 4 to 8. We definitely add by 4, but we don't multiply by 4, because that would become 16 here. So A, that's not true. Okay, the next one, it's basically got the same information. However, we're going to decrease the acceleration two times. Well, going from here to here, we're definitely not decreasing acceleration. So B, that's not true. Okay, for C, let's go ahead and highlight these guys. For this one, we're going to start with the net force being constant. So let's highlight that. And then we're going to double the mass. And that is true, we go from 2 to 4. But do we decrease the acceleration by half? Well, we do go from 4 to 2, and that cuts it in half. It does decrease. So C, that is the correct answer here. So for the ones that are complicated like this, take your time, eliminate the wrong ones, and you'll find it no problem. Okay, let's look at a diagram now. The diagram shows an event that occurs during meiosis. What is the result of this event? Well, based on the arrows, here's the start, here's the result. So which is true about these things here? A, chromosomes that are genetically identical to the paternal chromosome, but neither of these is identical to the parent, the paternal one, the red one there. So that is not true. Okay, B, chromosomes that are genetically identical again to the maternal chromosome, well, that would mean they look exactly like this one, but neither of them is completely blue, so that's not true. But see, chromosomes that are a genetic combination of the parents, and that's exactly what we have. It looks about a 75-25 split, and it is a good combination of both of them there. So that's all. Okay. You may be asked to make an inference about things. Scientists infer from the investigation that fish raised in water with higher levels of acidity have difficulty hearing predatory sounds. Which excerpt from the text supports this inference? Now the key is an inference is just to conclude from evidence. But what are we concluding? Well, fish raised in higher levels of acidity are going to have difficulty hearing predatory sounds. So let's check it out. Rising ocean acidity levels may harm marine life. For example, high acid levels may cause hearing loss. Well, they say it may happen and it may happen, but it's not based on any evidence. So A, that's not true. K for B, then sounds from a predatory fish were played from an underwater speaker at one end of the aquarium at a volume that was only audible to the fish when swimming near the speaker. Well, basically, they're just explaining the setup for the experiment they don't explain anything about higher levels of acidity. So there's no connection, there's no evidence, so B's out. Okay, C, the other tanks contained 600, 700, and 900 microatmospheres of CO2 respectively. Once again, they're explaining the setup, but not any evidence. So C, that's out. But finally, D, the study showed, so that's important, this is evidence now, 
that fish raised an elevated CO2 levels did not avoid the sounds of predator fish. So we have evidence for the claim that we're trying to prove up here, and that makes D a good inference for this one. Okay, let's look at variables now. The independent variable, that's the one that you control and you change. And the dependent, that's the data that you collect. So for the first one, a group of fertilized fish eggs from the same parents were divided into four different aquariums, each with a different pressure of CO2. But the thing they're controlling is different pressures of CO2, so that makes that the independent variable. Okay, the next part, to prepare for the experiment, one fish was placed in an aquarium containing the same CO2 pressure in which it was raised. The fish's position was recorded every five seconds for two minutes. So far, it looks like the fish's position, that's the data that was collected, but let's keep going. Then sounds from a predatory fish were played from an underwater speaker at one end of the aquarium at a volume that was only audible to fish when swimming near the speaker. The fish's position was again recorded every five seconds for two minutes. But that's it, the fish's position, that's what's being recorded, so that's the data we collect, and that makes that the dependent variable here. Okay, and you made it, just one last one. This one's a two-parter. Here we're finding the average bone density. But first, we don't have the bone density, so we need to find that. But they give us this nice formula, density is just mass divided by volume. So let's do that for the first one here. 6.8, that's the mass, divided by 22.6. And we could do that with the calculator, but that'll give us this amount. And then just keep going, mass divided by volume for all the other ones here. But next, we're going to find the average of those. So to find an average, you just add everything up, and that'll give us this amount. And then divide by how many you have. But we're looking at four samples, so divide by four. And that'll give us this for an average. But just rounding it, same thing as 0.31. So see, that's our final answer for this one. So I hope this is helpful for you. If you're looking for more GD science practice, check out my website in the description below. Here's a video with more GD science practice problems. Let me know what else you want me to cover. Good luck, you got these. Sorry I'm a little sick in this video. We'll see you in the next one. Toodles.